Ronnie, I don't know where else to start other than to ask, what is your earliest memory of racing? How did, when did you first become aware that your dad was, was a racer and did something different than what most other kids did? Well, I was aware of it all my life because he did it most of my life, but it was not, race was not our 100% focal point. We had a service station, I say we, he had a service station, of course I went into that, and right here in Christburg, we got into a little bit of rental, he got into it, he got me into it, so race was not like 100% of what we invested in, and we'll get into it. I, at the time, I didn't like it, what he was doing. I wanted him to sell, he had, at the time back, uh, when I started running for rookie in 78, uh, could say 77, but I only ran five races. But in 78, I want him to sell everything he had. I said, we want to sell his house. I'll, he had three or four rental houses. I want to sell them. And they had a few thousand savings. I want to take all that out of the bank. And I just, you know, as a kid, I wanted, wanted to race, but I didn't want to race like I knew I was going to have to race. And I, to be honest with you, I knew which, after a little bit, I knew which side the, my bread was buttered on. And a lot of people may not understand this, some will. He told me one day, he said, either we go slow or we don't go. Because he said, we can sell what we've got and go to a few races, balls out. But he said, if you don't make a good showing, if we don't get a sponsor or you don't get a ride, you're flashing a pan. So, you know, I ran, I think, 197 races. I qualified for more than that. Uh, Buddy Arrington missed a race at Wilkesboro. I let him start the car, so technically that gives Buddy Arrington credit for my position. I went to um, uh, an Dover, Delaware, and a guy by the name of Joe Boer lost his life driving Daytona Dash cars. He had driven my cars a few times, and I had to get into you a funny story about Joe Boer. Y'all love it, but anyway. Uh, so the few races, I probably qualified for around 200 races, and. It just got to getting tough, more expensive, more expensive, and I've seen the handwriting on the wall, so we'll get into it later about when I kind of give it up, went to late models. But yeah, I, I kind of knew early on I wanted to race. Um, I don't really think it had anything to do with my dad driving a race car. If he hadn't been driving, more than likely, I'd been like thousands of other guys. I'd have been a mini stock or a, a late model or a limited or a dirt car. I'd have never got, if it hadn't been for my dad, I'd never got to drive in the Cup Series. So I was not proud of a lot of uh, what our outcome was in the long run, but I guess you can say I got to go to the dance in a matter of speaking. Well, when, uh, when you first knew of your dad's business, which, which was Jabe's Golf Station, right? Right. 24 hours a day, right? right. I right. assume you worked there. Yeah, just like everybody else, I, you know, I hung around the gas station, worked there, and actually when, like a lot of people my age or older, when you first started working there, you didn't get paid. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, you hung out, and you did your thing, you know, I mowed the yard, and you didn't get paid for mowing the yard, and you washed the car, you didn't get paid for washing the car, and you go out to the service station, you hang out two or three hours, clean the windshields, gauge your tires, put the tires on, even when I was... 15, you didn't get paid, now later on I did, but it was a deal, you just did what you had to do to help the family out at the time. All right, well, during that time as a teenager, and let's say in your high school years, did you have any aspirations to go and do anything else except go into racing, no. nothing else? No, that's all I dreamed of, that's all I thought about, I just, you know, like I said, we're going back like a lot of other people dreamed of doing, but the opportunity that I had that a lot of other people didn't have was when I started, we was just talking, uh, Jimmy Cox sitting here now to help my dad, crew chief for him for years. The the thing, Charlie Roberts in Alabama, I seen him on, uh, did a thing on Facebook and he was talking about how he struggled, and I talked to him at the uh, Talks for Tots a couple of years ago, and he did it for several years, and he was talking about how much money it cost him, and you finally get out, you know. So when I got in, you know, wanted to do it, 
I didn't, even though I'd been around it, I thought it was going to be easier than what it was. I thought, you know, I'm a young cat. I'm going to get in here. I'm going to get a sponsor. We'll get to running good. I could not understand it then. Ned Jarrett, Steve, Steve Burns, um, Larry Newber, uh, Jenkins, all these people like me. Of course, my dad was pretty sort. He was ahead of me, so they knew him before me. Well, naturally, that made it easier for me to be friends with them. And they kind of got a deal. Ned said, you know, we want to try to help you get a sponsor. And I couldn't understand why I couldn't get one in. A good, I mean, we had sponsors, $300, 500 bucks a race. You know, you know, we could never get the big bucks a lot of people need, and a lot of people couldn't get it. But the thing I, I did have was I had a truck when I started. I had a car when I started. It might have been a 10-year-old truck. might have been a 7 year, 8-year-old car. But I did have something to start with. Well, you knew how your father had to race, didn't you? You were pretty aware of how, how he had to race. How, he wasn't one of those big shots by any stretch of imagination. although he's a good driver, don't misunderstand me, and he was very popular, but he couldn't race on the level that you were dreaming at, right? You knew that. And i tell you exactly what I told him. I said, when I, I'm not gonna run like you and J.D. McDuffie, and it, not just J.D. was three or four, I'm not knocking, said, I'm not going to be like you and J.D. and Elmo Langley and Dick May. He said, what? I said, I'm not running back there. And he said, well, okay, you'll be out in a little bit. So <laughs> I, go to po I go to Barnesville, wherever the first race. You know, they're running a 600 gear or 620. We put a 583. We didn't have new tires. We had used tires. When you talk about new tires, now you talk about used tires, the thing about the tires being used then but to make the long story short, I go to Martinsville. We, they pulled like a 600 gear at the time. We put a 583 in. We borrowed a set of tires or paid. A lot of times you give $100 or 50 bucks to Richard or to Petty or to Junior, and they give you a set of tires that had three or four laps on. You put them on to qualify with, and you take them off and put your old tires on to run the race. Well, that's when I kind of thought, wow, and I'm going to jump ahead on a couple of things. In 1982, I think Kyle Petty started running like 81 maybe cup or 80. He started in 79. He ran his first handful in 79 and then I guess went full time in 80. Yeah. All right. 81. In 80 or 81, we were at Bristol. Kyle pulls in. He had three or four guys with STP uniforms on. He had three or four sets of new tires and all this. And I'm sitting there and told my dad, uh, to show you how my dad knew how to work me. He was, he's this old crazy guy, but he, he was a lot smarter than lady, what he put on. I'll just give you an example. I said, um, I said, I want to be like that. That's what I said, man, we need a new car. We need tires. We need to go get us the engine from Junior or whoever was building good motors at the time, Robert Yates. We need to go buy a motor from him. So he sits me down on the wall at Bristol, and he said, you got to realize if I was Richard Petty, you would have that stuff. <clears throat> I can't afford to do it. I can't afford to buy it. And you're just going to have to run like we can run. It's just how it is. <clears throat> so what happened is, and oh, and he said, the last thing he said was, he said, you see up in the stands, all these, see these people up there, you see these kids, 20, 18, 20, 25 year olds? I said, yeah. He said, you know how many of them kids would love to be sitting in this car? He said, so that's just how it is. He said, you cannot worry about Kyle Petty. And that's when I realized I just gotta be glad for what I got. So when I realized either I'm gonna race like I'm gonna race, or we're going to be out of it. So I just had to race like we raced, like a lot of other people did. Well, you realized, of course, your father's personality and realized how popular he was among fans in the media because he was, he was a kind of an outgoing, funny guy. And that got him, you know, a considerable amount of press. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, I don't suppose during this entire time, 
You lived uncomfortably, did you? No. I didn't think so. No, I was uh, very fortunate to have him and my mother, and I'm telling you, I was so, I look at now at my life, and he said, probably about 83, and he was getting where he wasn't going to the track as much. I done, 82, I kind of just took it over, and he'd go four or five races, he'd stay at the service station, he'd go to a couple, he'd miss a couple, and he was getting to be more me and just the guys, and he told me about 84, he said, if you will hang with me, listen to me you can live a pretty comfortable life that don't mean you know uh no rich cat you know live a jet set life but i'm now where he told me 30 years ago said you listen to me things will be good for you in life and right now i'm i'm very blessed now does that mean i want to want to want a cup race want a championship uh set on some poles yeah but we quit cup in 89, I ran my last race. I just run a race or two here, and most time I drive James Hilton's car a couple races, and a guy by the name of Lucky Compton out of West Virginia drove it one race. Then we, I sell my cup stuff out. We go to late model, and all of a sudden I go to late model. It took me three, you know, the cars are lighter, less horsepower, and it took me three or four races to get them figured out. The next thing you know, we're winning, you know, we're going to Martinsville and Coburn and Franklin County and North Wilkesboro and these places, Kingsport and all. I'm like, man, you know, I said, this is what it's all about. And I got a thing on the wall right here where, you know, it says, uh, run of times did the yay boo driver, 93. I got to actually winning so much. I mean, everywhere we go, if we won winning, we were competitive. Next thing I know, I've got fans in the stands giving me the finger, <laughs> cussing me, and I'm like, man, everybody used to like me. But then that's when I realized, you talk about Waltrip and Kale and all these people booing, it made me realize it don't matter what division you're in, people don't like somebody to win too much. But I'm going to tell you, the finger and the booing, I loved it. It never, it never got old. And a funny story, in, in 93 they were interviewing me, and I got out of the car, and it's one particular track up here. We'd won 12 races that, that year, and it was near the end of the season. I got out, and the Art Booth, he was a track announcer, and then he went to try, and every time he tried to interview me, everybody would start hollering and booing because they were right you know, the, near the track. And... Finally, Art said, well, we get everybody to calm down. We'll get an interview with me if everybody, with you if everybody quit booing you. And I said, they're not going boo. And he said, what? And I said, they're going ooh, ooh. And I said, that they all went crazy then. But, you know, so I got the experience when I quit Cup the last 10 or 12 years of my life. I got to experience something, and I never – you know, you got Jody Ridley and – Gary Ballou and Rich Bickle and Dick Trickle. Of course, Dick ran pretty good there at times when he was in that Miller car and all. But I was so wrapped up in cup racing that I didn't, I, it sounds silly, that I didn't know any other racing existed. I mean, the Bush, they were there on Saturday to run a race. I knew about it. But I mean, I stayed at my shop in Christiansburg with the guys, and I didn't, you know, I knew of Jody Ridley and Dick Trickle. I've heard of them. You know, everybody had heard of Dick Trickle. But you kind of think, man, these guys run cup. They're winning so much at these other tracks. You know, you hear they win 300 races, 500, 1,000 races, one everywhere, snowball derbies and all stuff. I'm like, how come they can't do it in cup? Well, I figured it out. Yeah. I did it reverse. I started out. Kind of, we run the Baby Grands, which Daytona Dash for a couple years, about 20 races. Set on a pole or two, led some races, fell out, blowed motors on, then went into the cup. And it just went on, and we did the best we could do. And then, then I realized, now I see what so many other guys went through not being able to win a cup. But the, the whole thing about it is, is we got to... I got, you know, people tell me now, I mean, they come up now, there'll be people 25, and their dad will be with them now, say, he was rookie of the year, and said, Dad, and I go, really? 
And you have to, we're talking about young people, 20, 25. He said, he used to race with Dale Earnhardt, Richard Petty. You really race with Dale Earnhardt? I said, well, I was on the same track. I put it <laughs> that way. But yeah. the, the yeah. whole gig is, I can say I did race with Earnhardt, Petty, Yarborough, uh, you know, Johnny Rutherford, Indy people. And we get on to it. Don't let's not forget, I'll tell you the last time that I ever talked to Dale Earnhardt Jr. And I'm going to tell you the last time I ever talked to Dale Earnhardt Sr. And it's both of them is a senior moment is a funny one. I never talked to him, but we'd be garaged across from each other. A lot of people know with the way the points ran, y'all they take one side going down the garage like a Talladega, and you have first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and cup. And go to the end. Well, then you come all the way up the other side of the garage. You know, that'd be where a lot of the independents. So sometimes our toolbox, and say maybe Leonard Woods or Junior's toolbox, whatever, would be back to back because we might be 25th in the points. They might be fifth. So the way it would end up, you would be kind of garaged across from each other. And I'd speak to Earnhardt a little bit then, you know, because he'd be sitting on a table. But don't ever forget, we'll get into the Earnhardt story, and you'll like it. Well, go ahead and fire away. You want me to laugh? Okay. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead of things. This... Okay. The last time Dale Earnhardt ever spoke to me would have been in about 80, I'm going to say about 83. I don't know if he got even got in the intimidator part yet or not, but he come up to me, and he, it was the race after – Darlington, I can't remember if it was Rockingham or Darlington. So he comes up to me and he says, Ron, I need to talk to you a minute. This was the next week after that race. And the reason I'm saying them particular tracks where people know what I'm talking about is at Rockingham, you remember you go in turn three, it was kind of tight going down in there. You could really mess a leader up because it, it, it tired up. And at Darlington, you could really mess somebody up going in three Okay, Dale comes up to me. He said, I talked to you, man. I said, yeah. And I thought, what in the world? And he said, boy, you sure crowded me several times last week. And I said, what? And he said, I come up on passion. I said, man, you just be the right place. And you was up on the track and you, you blocked me. And I said, yeah, you rubbed me a couple times. You know, in the car, I tried not to tear it up. And he, you rubbed me a couple times. He said, you take a little bit too much room. I said, all right, I know what I'll do from now on. I said, let's see, track two lanes wide. I said, yeah. I said, well, next from now on what I'll do, I'll run halfway on the apron, and I'll give you a, a lane and a half, and that gives me a half a lane on the apron. That'd be good. He looked at me and shook his head, and he, I could tell what he was wanting to tell me. He just turned and walked off. That's the last time, last time he ever spoke to me. He was... He was steaming. I mean, wow. he didn't yeah. like – well, I thought I was giving him enough room, but I'm telling you, he was one of the better – anybody knows he's one of the greater ones. But he's one of them guys, you give him an inch, he'd take a mile. I mean, man, I, I did. I, you know when he come up on you, that's where he got that intimidator. He would just kind of want to rally, even if he's a little guy. He would have so much respect for you, but, you know, he wanted part of your lane and all of his. All right, I'm going to tell you the last time I ever talked to Dale Earnhardt Jr. Most and, recent time you talked to Dale Earnhardt Jr. Well, most recent was 96 <laughs> or something. Hey, I'm too far down the pecking order. But anyway, so what I was going to tell you, we was at Martinsville, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. was running late model stock cars. I'm going to say it was 96, 90, 95, 96, somewhere like But he had a... Best I remember a red Camaro or something running it. He comes over to me, little old bitty skinny feller then. He says, now you got to realize, I'd been to Martins in a late model. We sat on a pole four times in like six years, won a race there. So we sat on a pole that day. So he comes up to me, and I guess it was, I don't remember if it was, it had to be before qualifying. He said, my crew guy told me you get a, Ran here pretty good late model car. And I said, what are you doing late model? And he said, yeah. And he said, would you follow me for a few laps? And I said, well, sure. And I said, then I'm going to motion you by, and then I'm going to follow you for a few laps. And I said, okay, just tell me 
what I'm doing wrong getting in the corner and all. Okay, so we go out, run a few laps, and he was pretty slow. I mean, you know, he was learning. So he's pretty slow. He gets out behind me, and I look up, and he get, I let him catch up and run a lap or two, and I'd be 10 car lengths ahead of him. I'd let him catch up, get behind him, come over, and he said, what am I doing wrong? And I said, you need, you need to let your car hang out a little bit more getting in. And I said, go down there instead of slamming the brakes on, kind of kind of roll into your brake. Don't slam it so hard and get you a good arc in the corner. And I just tell him, you know, things like that. Okay, okay. And he said, he said, well, I'll tell you one thing. He said, your car's got a whole lot more horsepower than mine does. And the guy with me, was a very, and he, if he would ever got in cup about 20 years later, he could have been a Jake Elder or an M. And this guy was smart. He didn't start racing till about 90 or 91. He, he helped the team before he helped me a year. Started me, and he's, but he did not like Dale Earnhardt at all. And I said, uh, Mike said, well, why don't you go to NASCAR and get him make a rule change like for your dad? That's about to, see, this was about the time, maybe a little after, if y'all remember, Jeff Gordon was winning a lot, and they made some of the Chevrolet seem like to me, take a little bit off their spoiler, and Earnhardt said, we're having enough trouble keeping up now without them making rule changes to us. And that's why Mike said it. When he walked off, I told Mike, I said, you, you shouldn't have said that. And he said, well, he come over here asking you for help. And I said, yeah, but I don't care if it is. Dale Earnhardt, Dale Earnhardt Jr., that's his father. And I said, and Mike got a little mad at me for saying that, but, you know, I always thought, I don't care who it is, you have a little bit of respect for somebody's dad, but he just didn't think when he said, but that's the last conversation with Junior and the last one with Earnhardt Sr. I don't know how to go from Dale Earnhardt Jr. back to 78. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead too far. Um, we can edit. How did you... How did you make the decision to run for Rookie of the Year? Well, it, I had the car. And when I say I had a car, we had a truck my dad got from Junior Johnson in 72, I believe. And Junior now run it. I think Lee, they hauled Leroy's car on it and some back in the day. I don't know who else, but the car they, truck they used to haul. So that's a truck I used till 81. Had, so I had a truck. I had a car, and it was an ex-Bobby Allison car. And everybody, you know, people now say, dang, you ought to run better than a Bobby Allison car. Well, dang, this was 77. The car was built in like 71 or 2. <laughs> and Bobby <laughs> run it for a year or two. James Hilton got it from Bobby. He'd run it for a year or two. And my dad got it, and he run it for a, a year or two, something like it. And then, you know, Earl Brooks drove it, and Dick May, and... Everybody you think of would drive it. So I had the car and I had the truck, and you know, we talked about it. And we said, but Dad said, we're gonna do it, we'll do it now. So it was just, technically, we honestly should not have won Rookie of the Year. The guy that should have won it was two or three. I got to listen, there was 20 people. I got to, I still got the original rundown from Daytona. There was 20 people in 1978 started running for Rookie of the Year. Roland Velotica, uh, Chuck Bound, Roger Hamby. I mean, there was some pretty cotton-picking big names in there. And my dad said, we can't outrun these guys. We got to try to outsmart them. And this is where I'm going to give my dad credit. So we didn't do – I bought a car up. We used that car – for the four or five race I ran in 77. 78, we ran that car a good bit, but we had got a car off of Richard Childress that he had ran. I don't know if he ran it for two years or what, but it was an old banjo, Monte Carlo, uh, a number three car. It had actually, I think if you remember, it had Molly Black Gold or something on the quarter panels and uh, Anderson Webb trucking or something. We bought that car from Richard. So we run that car in 70. Eight and the Chevelle, and it was just a deal. We had used stuff. We had a used motor that a guy by the name of Billy Leonard down in Roanoke built, and actually Bill Blair was the one that started freshening it up after that. 
So we just, we just ran, did the best we could, and what happened? Two-thirds of them run out of money. The other two or three crashed herself out till they just didn't have anything. Roland Velotica should have won it. He was with uh, Rod Osterlin. He wrecked. He just wanted to, you know, he tried to run like he was a Cal Yarbrough, but he didn't nothing against him. He didn't have experience. So he crashed out, crashed out. And Roger Hamby was the next man. And Roger Hamby was like that with Junior Johnson. And the reason he was like that, it wasn't that Junior liked Roger so much, but he liked his Uncle Ben's. And I'm mean, just telling like, like it is. And I stopped by Roger's about a year ago. I hadn't seen him for 30 years. And he told us, he said, I spent about $200,000 with Junior. Now, we're talking about 1978, so I don't know what that is. Probably, what, a million dollars by today's standards? i say it'd be more than that. Yeah. yeah. We spent 70 some thousand dollars in one rookie of the year. No he spent, kidding. Yeah, he spent almost triple what we did. And I'm going to tell you, he, when I stopped by and saw him, he didn't know who I was. I go in his shop. Hey, what can he's got a little muffler shop in Wilkesboro. I go in there and I said, I said, uh, how you doing, Roger Art? What can I do for you? And I said, I got a 75 Monte Carlo, which is what I started. Well, I started with Chevelle, but the Monte Carlo is what we won rookie of the year with. So I got a 75 Monte Carlo. I wonder if you can put an exhaust system on it. He said, well, and I said, it's old cup car. Cup car? And I said, yeah, can you put an exhaust system on it? So I need to look at it. I said, it's... I said, it's Ronnie Thomas's old car that you run against for Rook of the Year. And he said, oh, yeah, I remember Ronnie. He said, boy, he got lucky he won that thing. And he went on, <laughs> carrying on. He said, he said, I hadn't had some trouble. And I said, I better butt in for he really lays into me. Well, you know, can't drive and all this. So I got in there and said, hey. I said, I'm Ronnie. He said, what? I'm Ronnie. He said, what the world? So, you know, we got to laughing and joking about it. And he said, really, I should have beat you. I said, well, Roger, you spent two or three times what we did. And he said, we couldn't understand with Junior helping you why you didn't. And he said, well, we just had trouble. And I'll tell you what it was. He had transmissions, and he kept busting the tail houses. This is where having my dad being on the other end would help him. He was running these lightweight transmission tail houses. We had the old stuff to run steel, which was heavy. Roger was trying to save a little bit of weight. And about the third or fourth time that broke, he fell out of race. We was going down the road. My dad said, why in the world don't Hamby quit running those lightweight parts and put some heavy stuff in? So technically, I would say that transmissions cost Roger rookie of the year. They don't make no difference. But see, we would outrun Roger some, he would outrun me. But he had way, I, you know, he was talking about should have done this and that, but I'm going to tell you with the equipment that he had against what I had, I should have never outrun Roger. Right. And I seen a thing with Ken Squire on uh, YouTube the day guy showed me. And we was at Ontario the last race. And I passed Roger and, you know, and 20 laps later, he passed me. We was right there together. And I was one point ahead of him, I thought. And my dad told me on the radio, he said, boy, don't wreck because he finished for, you know, he could be. So we was kind of running hard enough to outrun him, but I knew who, who we were wanting to beat to get the uh, rookie of the year. So it just worked out. It worked out, and we won it. But we shouldn't have won it, but we did work. What was your record in 78? Do you remember your Seven. record? Uh, I don't know. It's uh, far down. I don't know if I'd find it or not. <laughs> but yeah, I don't really, you know, I only had, I think, seven or eight top tens. Um, you know, we, like I said, would I say I'm ashamed of the way I, yeah, you know, people say, don't say that. But I was, you know, I wanted, I'm no different than any other kid. I wanted to, I went even to the point, I, I got there after a year or two. I didn't want to win. I just wanted to run decent. And I just got, so dag blame, sick of struggling, and finally just about 84, I just said, you know, Bobby Allison comes to me at Bristol. Right after the deal with my dad, he'd sit down and talk to me. You know, how many, if I was Richard, you'd have the same stuff Kyle does. 
How many, how many of these kids in the stands would love to be sitting in his car? Yep, he's right. He sends Bobby Allison down. I went, Dad used this reverse psychology all the time on me. He's, Bobby comes down and said, I need to talk to you, Ronnie. What the heck? As soon as he walked off, I knew what the deal was. He said, sit down. I said, okay. He said, Ronnie, you cannot break your dad. And I said, what? He said, you gotta run the best you can run with what you got, and if you get a sponsor, if it hamps, it hamps, it don't, it don't. And I said, yeah, and he said, um, he said, just do the best you can with what you got, and don't worry about it. And I said, okay, well, I tell you what, you take my car and run tomorrow night, <laughs> I'll take yours, and he just shook his head like that. I, you know, I guess thinking, I'm trying to help you, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. you know, I saw where he was coming from, but I knew then that my dad had went and talked to Bobby and got him to come down and try to. So, I don't know, that's, that's the way that went. So I did it till I got tired of it and I wasn't gonna go broke. And mm -hmm. I've seen so many people would talk about, go back to my dad, how things are. Yeah, I'm not gonna mention any names, but I can tell you, I can mention three names, but I won't. People that ran Cup. That ran pretty good. And they're living on a $800 a month, $1,000 a month social security check. No disrespect to them, but I mean, they're like, we're gonna run. I can tell you a guy right now, I mentioned his name because he's told me, and he's Irvin Brooks, which Earl Brooks' son. He was, I think he said it was five in the family. And he, I mentioned his name because he's told this in front of people, told me, he said, our dad kind of kept us in the poor house because of racing. In other words, he was going to race, and he told me, he said, I'll never forget, we didn't have anything much. And I said, a headers come in from home and moved here, Gabble or somebody, and they were $700. Now, we're talking about back in the early 70s or something, and he said, 700 bucks. And he said, I'm like, you know, and he said, Mom was working a job to help him race. And I remember he said, somebody's mom saying, $700 for a set of headers? which was a bunch of money. But I'm just saying, Earl, I, I don't know. Now, Earl might have had some money, you know, at the end. I'm just saying at the time, but Earl wanted to race, and Irvin just said he was going to race, hell or high water, and whatever it took from the family. So my dad did the opposite. We're going to race so hard, but we're going to put some in the kitty. And now there's people now would probably say, well, you should have took the kitty and bought a Junior Johnson motor and tires, but there was not enough, you know, it would it was this much coming in and it would have been that much going out. So it's no way we could financially and physically do it. So here I am, you know, sixty six years old and life's pretty good and had no complaints. Well Earl Brooks told me that same story in an interview once. So you're hundred percent right about Earl and his racing. He told me, he said, that I could give my family a pretty good living, I cut this out, but I don't want to cut it out. You know what it is? Yeah. I'm going to tell you. It's, tell me the same thing. Well, I've never drank, never done drugs, never been a smoker. It's three things I've done good in life. But I'm going to tell you, racing is an addiction. Hmm. I mean, it is just a plain out addiction. And, and you know, if it hadn't been, if it would have been up to me when I first started and not up to my dad, uh, some of the places still have them now. A few of the rental places, we wouldn't have them. I'd have got rid of everything. You know, I want a heck fire. I want. I saw mom's clothes. Everything wouldn't make no difference because <laughs> I wanted to race that bad. But I had. He had to keep me in check, and he done a pretty good job of it. So yeah, the record's not going to show. It doesn't like model. I done good, but what I found, we go around to these get-togethers now. It could be if you talk to a hundred people. There's 95 will talk about the cup. There's four or five said, hey, I used to go to Martinsville, to Wilkesboro, to Pulaski, New River, or Kingsport. He's going, boy, you kick butt there. But see, there's a small group of people that keep up with that, and there's a large group that keep up with the cup. And that's just how it is. In all of that time that you were racing the way that you had to because of finances, were there times where you went and talked to other team owners about, hey, give me a shot, uh, keep an eye on me, or maybe if there wasn't a ride actually open, 
Hey, I'd be interested. Yeah, I can give you both big ones. I talked to Harry Rainier at Atlanta in 81. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Benny Parsons might have been uh, driving white number 28. Okay, was there. And I talked to Harry and Waddell. And if I knew what I knew now, I wouldn't talk to them. Because, you know, I kind of look and I'm thinking, man, I want to do it. Can't y'all see? But I... They didn't see, they knew I wanted to do it, but they had to see those stats, yeah. those results. Yeah. So Harry said, I'll talk to Waddell in battle. When all honesty, he probably more than likely didn't even talk to him. That's fine. Ain't no problem. Uh, the biggest, Junior Johnson, 80, whenever Neil Bonnet and got the Budweiser deal, was that 83 or 4? He and had it in 83, but he didn't start driving for Junior until 84. All right. This is when he was with Junior. I got with Junior. I went down there, and he said, Ronnie, I'm going to talk to Budweiser for you. For some reason, Junior took a liking to me. I don't know if it was my dad to start with or what, but, you know, I've been down Junior's a half a dozen times, and what was funny, when I went to Junior's, there was nobody there most of the time. I went up to his house two or three times while he was eating, him and Flossie. Trying to say that he had a sister maybe afflicted. I might have been wrong in a wheelchair. And he had a brother by the name of Fred, I believe. So I'd go up there and, you know, I'd go up there and, you know, go up. And I'd get, what I'd do, I'd go down and get parts. But I would go down after hours, late at night. Nobody, Hammond, Brewer, and all these people, Mike, all them guys were gone. Go down there and you bring some cash and, you know, you get a set of heads and used crank and, uh, road or something, you know, Junior said, ah, give me $200, and, you know, he liked that greenback, so you go down and give him money and get stuff from him like that, but Junior said, I'm going to talk to Budweiser for you. I really feel like, honestly, that I think probably Jeff Hammond and Tim Brewer, honestly, I think he probably talked to him, and I feel like they probably said no, because from what I understand, when he was talking about putting Daryl in the car. I don't think they wanted Daryl in the car. Am I right in saying that? Well, if they didn't want Daryl in the car, they didn't want me in their frig, and they didn't want me hauling their pit gas down the pit road. <laughs> you know, their the little wagon. So you yeah. can figure where I'm coming from. And I said, Junior, man, just what I want to do, can we go to Wilkesburg somewhere and test? Just spend a day with me. He said, I'm going to talk to Budweiser about giving you a chance. And I said, I'm telling you, I can do it. Just give me a chance. So a few days goes by, he didn't call, he didn't, I didn't go down, he called me and he said, I was going to tell you, I talked to Budweiser, they're going to go with Neil Bonnet. That kind of took the steam out, but I look back now, I can understand why. I could understand why maybe some of his crew guys wanted it. The other one was, I really screwed up, was Larry McClure. He calls me 9 o'clock on a Monday morning, and I think it was the week that they put Tommy Ellis in the car at Bristol. And not positive, but I think it was Tommy. Larry calls me up and said, I'm trying to find somebody to put in my car. He said, I talked to Junior. Junior said, give Ronnie Thomas a chance. The boy can drive. He just needs opportunity. I'm going to give you a chance. Here's where I goofed up. I didn't goof up. I screwed up. I was trying to tell him how to run his team. I'm thinking, afterwards, I'm telling a guy how to run his team that's out running me all the time. And here's what I'm getting at. If y'all remember, he had, uh, I'm trying to say, Mark Martin, Tommy Ellis, Lenny Pond, uh, Joe Rutman. Do y'all remember? He went through a lot of, a lot of, y'all done it on the show. I mean, he said, well, I can't remember if he was grasping for straws on y'all show, something like that, trying to find lightning in a bottle or something or other. All I said was, I said, Larry, I'm going to get Mike Potter. Do y'all remember driver drove yeah. in? I said, I'm going to get my track to the car at Bristol on Friday morning. Marshall Rawson was my crew guy then. I'll get a, somebody to come with him. I'm going to get it to the track. I'll roll it off. I won't mess with the car no more. He said, I'm offering you an opportunity to drive. He said, I got Junior's Motors, Ronnie, and all, and I got new tires. That's what you've been wanting. I said, yeah, but... I'm just going to get it to the track. Well, why are you getting your car to the track? And I said, Larry, don't listen. 
I think you got internal problems. And he said, what? And I said, why are you put all these drivers in and they're in there for a race or two or three or four and you kick them out? And I said, you've had some pretty darn good name drivers in there. And I said, I don't want to be in it a race or two and you kick me out. So I said, I'm taking my car to the track and if you kick me out, at least I'm still in the point system. <laughs> And so what are you saying? I'm saying, I know I can do it, but I want the opportunity. But I want, I think Glover maybe was the crew chief chassis man then, Tony Glover. And I said, I want to work with the chassis guy. I said, I'm no expert, but I know a little about these springs and shocks and sway bars. And just, if he'll work with me, but you're not telling me how to run my outfit. I said, I'm not. He said, well, it sounds like me, you are. I said, I'm not, Larry. I want the opportunity. I said, I'm telling you, I can do it, just do it. He said, let me tell you something. You do it, it's my way or the highway. And I said, so what is He said, are you taking your car track? I said, just go take it there and load. He said, talk to you later. Click, that's the last time I ever talked to him. So wow. more than likely, I feel like that was a big screw up on my part, but I didn't want to get the opportunity and, and something happened and he kicked out. But the thing about it is, if I would have gotten an opportunity and I'd have just run eighth or tenth in the car, maybe led some laps, qualified good, who knows where it would have opened the door for me. I, I just really should have kept, kept my mouth shut, drove the car and shut up. I just went around it about it completely wrong. Too late now though. 